We have this first statement over here, all right? And it's up to you to convince me. I've had a look at the statement before and I think you're gonna have a hard time. All right, so here's the first <laughs> statement, okay? We are masters uh -huh. of our own fate. Now, this, this one is a no-brainer, right? I mean, we are masters of our own fate. I'm sitting in this chair because I chose to and you're sitting there in Australia because you chose to. So how, how, is, how, is, this, how is this even a debate? It's, it's obvious, we can just go home now, right? Well, I think there might be a little bit of cognitive bias and blind sight going on there with you, Sid, oh. uh, which is something that we're going to be <laughs> talking about over the next <laughs> couple of myths, actually. Um, so you might also be predetermined to be a little bit of a pessimist. Maybe, maybe. We'll be exploring that one as well. Uh -oh. um, so as you said earlier, since the dawn of humanity, our species have been trying to figure out who or what is calling the shots. And there's some people out there that believe that they are very much in control of their own lives and they are masters of their own destiny. Whereas there's other people that believe that they might be closer to pre-programmed machines than maybe we'd like to think. And actually, there's a lot of um, fate that's written into us. Um, and these are, these are discussions, as you mentioned, that theologians and philosophers have been debating for centuries um, and ideas and concepts that have really fascinated humanity across different cultures and across our history. Um, and more recently, neuroscientists like myself have joined in the study. Um, and the reason for that is because we can now start to peer into the brain and watch a conscious, living, moving mammal go about its everyday life and navigate the space around it and make decisions and choices in life. And as we watch the brain, we can see the, the, the mechanisms, the very engineering, the very architecture within our brain that underpins how we make our decisions and our choices in life. And um, we can see this zip of electricity that allows us to think we can see new ideas spark to life. And what this information is telling us is that we need to start really to question what it means to be human uh, and to really start to probe this idea of destiny and fate. But um, we have, and the okay, so we have that natural really impulses. I'm, I'm, huh? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we have natural impulses, right? But at the same time, we have a higher level of choice. So I can, I can decide, okay, I'm feeling really hungry right now, but I'm on an intermittent fasting diet, so I'm going to eat at five. So that's, that is taking control of your own circumstances, isn't it? Well, in some ways, yeah. What I want to bring up, actually, because you've kind of moved me on to this, is um, a slide where I've got some lovely data, because I love data. Okay, let's have a <laughs> I look. I love numbers. Ooh, so visuals. thank you very much for bringing this up. Okay, so you're talking about food preferences, right, and being on an intermittent fasting diet. Um, so... So what we've been finding out from lots of genomics uh, results and genomic studies, analyzing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, uh, for their 3.2 billion base pairs of unique DNA, which makes up their blueprint for life. Um, what you can see when you analyze this DNA, and it now takes, takes less than 30 minutes to sequence this 3.2 billion base pairs, and it costs less than $1,000 to do it. So, so there's huge swaths of the population that are undergoing this genomic analysis. And what you can tell from this analysis is that um, it's not just our bodily kind of... Um, kind of appearances, like a height and an eye color, for example, that have this high heritable or genetic predisposition to it. Um, and it's not even things like our obesity levels, our um, body mass index, but also a more complex behavioral types. For example, um, autism, schizophrenia, even our intelligence, that has quite a high hereditary basis to it. Even our socioeconomic status or our ideology or our beliefs even how long we will live or how resistant we might be to mental Ill, Ill health problems throughout our life. Um, so we're increasingly finding that there's a gen genetic basis to very complex behaviors. So you were talking earlier about um, food preferences and you're, you're trying to, so you might have a genetic predisposition to put on weight in particular uh, ways around your body and you're trying to nudge that back to a healthy BMI. You look very healthy, by the way. Well, thank in a good you. Way. I wasn't fishing for that, but I appreciate it anyway. <laughs> so you might have, um, you might be genetically predisposed to be on the larger side. And so, and a lot of people are, um, which makes then dieting in this world, this environment where we're living in now, where it's very easy for us to get calorie rich foods, you know, just at a press of a delivery button, 
kind of thing, um, very difficult. But some people will find dieting much harder than others because of their metabolic uh, genetic predisposition, if you like. Yeah, but if you're um, saying that we, we're not masters say, of our own fate, then essentially what you're saying is that if you're on the larger side, it's going to be impossible for you to, to, to lose that weight or to kind of get your BMI down to what's considered a healthy level. So you're saying that that's not possible? It's, it's going to be, so you can change certain aspects of your personality. So you're leaping ahead to the next myth burn. <laughs> you're getting ahead of yourself there. So what I wanted, what I wanted to say is that there's, we've got this genetic predisposition within us, each of us have these biological constraints, if you like. So there's some things that we are going to be naturally very good at and some things that we're going to be naturally, we're going to find them quite difficult. Um, and that they are the bi biological constraints that are written, written into our DNA. Now, the majority of those genes that are involved in higher biological kind of brain functions, behavioral functions, if you like, um, are thousands of genes that are working in tandem. And they're usually genes that are involved in setting the circuitry for our brains, how our um, billions of nerve cells kind of wire up together as we're a baby in the womb. And there's been some incredible um, mm. developments in technology recently, which mean that scientists can now peer into the brain of a baby as that baby is still in the womb um, during pregnancy, during gestation. And they can start to image that neural circuitry um, being formed, the foundations for its brain being made wow. um, at a very early stage in development. Um, and what they can see is that there's different anatomical signatures for different genes that are linked to ADHD, for example, or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia even. So we're talking about symptoms that might not emerge for decades down the line. They can see that there's anatomical signatures, kind of fingerprints within that neural circuitry for that baby even before it's born. So its okay. fate is in some way written into that neural circuitry even before birth. So there are some biological constraints which are given to us from mm. our DNA from which there is no real escaping. And so, so are we okay. completely yeah. masters of our own fate? No, we, we, each of us has limits or idiosyncrasies, right. if, you say, if you want. Maybe they're not limits. Maybe they're not, you know, there, there are certain yeah. constraints, some things that we are going to be very good at, some things that we're, you know, we're going to struggle with. And actually, maybe it's better to accept that we are not fully in control of our own lives. And actually, there are some constraints there for each of us. And okay. that's OK. Maybe we should embrace these. Yeah, uh, let, let, let's do that. OK, like. fine. You've, you've convinced me. But more importantly, you've convinced the audience. They've been sending in those fire emojis like crazy. All right, fine. Round one, you win. OK, so here, here's the next statement. I'm very, I'm biologically wired and competitive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that myth has been burned. Let's look at the second one. So we can change our personalities. Now, OK, I have, you, you brought visuals. I have visuals as well. So here's, here's my little challenge for you. Describe me in one word. Now? Yeah, right now. I, I don't know you. Um, handsome. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> handsome, that, that, that's one personality trait. Guess what? I just became a legend, all right? I just changed my personality that quickly, OK? You, you, you can't convince me that this is, that, that this is a myth. I, I'm not sure what to say. I'm sure you're, you're a handsome legend. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> but I literally just changed my personality in front of your eyes. According to who? According to me. Because I'm a master of my own <laughs> okay, well, fate, apparently. But, okay, well, that's your reality. That is your reality. And, um, and this actually does tie in with what my answer is to this, is okay. how we perceive the world and how, how we, our brain makes assumptions about the world all the time. All right, okay, so me. you can change <laughs> your mind. Okay, so for, for this myth, I'm going to ask us to concentrate not on legends or handsomeness, <laughs> um, but actually concentrate on, you know, what I've been watching with this global pandemic uh, is that some people... Uh, responding to stress fairly well. Like they're just complete optimists. So they might be living in situations where they're, you know, in really cramped living quarters with lots of boisterous kids in their family that they've got to look after. They've got to juggle, you know, their work commitments, plus everything that's going on in this small living quarters with also knowing that a global recession's hitting. And yet I've got friends who are dealing with all this and they're just like, yeah, we're having a great time. They're just so optimistic. They're so, they're so happy. Every, every situation that life throws at them, they will 
they will bounce back and find the positive in it. Whereas I've got other friends who are really struggling, you know, um, and they, they're they really struggling with mm. how they're dealing with all of this. And, and it can be very easy to get stuck in kind of negative ruminations of thoughts and to kind of get stuck in habits of, you know, if you're stressed, you can reach for donuts, for example, or maybe 10 glasses of wine, or I don't know. I feel know, like this is getting personal for some reason. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's different ways. Different, different people have different styles of reacting to different situations. And some people seem to be more kind of optimistic rather than pessimistic. Um, but there's some people that seem to have maybe got themselves stuck in a rut at, rut at some point in their lives. And then they're able to change their lives around and kind of almost change their personality and change the way that their life trajectory is going. Right. And that's really interesting to me to see how that happens because maybe we all need to like get a glimmer of how that can happen so that we can ch all change certain aspects of our lives that we don't really like so that we can start kind of nudging ourselves in the right direction. And there's a, I actually did my PhD in kind of this, this concept, this idea, like the biological underpinnings for how it happens. Mm. There's this beautiful thing in the brain called plasticity, which basically means that... Um, all of us have the ability to change our minds and to change the way that we react to the world. Good. So um, we're not burning this way, <laughs> then, is what you're saying. No, no, no. Oh, hang on a second. So I'm like <laughs> lulling you into a full sense of security oh, by God. saying some nice things. <laughs> I'm dreading um, so, this already. So first of all, as you learn something from the environment, your nerve cells make connections. One nerve cell kind of makes a connection with the next nerve cell. And as that learned thing becomes a memory, it becomes a consolidated connection between nerve cells, um, which allow communication from one nerve cell to another. So that's a na now a nice stable connection, a nice stable dendritic spine. And that's basically called... Um, dendritic spine plasticity, and it's the basis for our consciousness and our ability to form a subjective view of the world. And I've got this beautiful little video, actually. Can you see those nice little yellow, kind of like light glimmer dots being shuttled across the nerve? Yeah, that's a helicopter uh, view of London, isn't it? That's, but that's, they kind of look like a helicopter. No, that's a beautiful nerve cell that's been lit up with a green fluorescent protein, a dye, um, and then imaged under a real high-powered high microscopy. Oh, wow. And what you're seeing there are proteins being shuttled back and forth across the nerve cell. And these proteins are the proteins that are involved in building memories. So you're actually watching memories being formed in the mind. How amazing is that? Wow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Anyway, so, so, so of course you can change, you can learn from your environment and you can change um, how you see the world and how you react to it based on this ability for us to have this plasticity, which, which occurs within our brain all the time. So hopefully when I'm chatting to you now, um, there's some plasticity going on. There's some of that like proteins being shut up. I'm you know, forming and I'm memories learning. as we speak, yes. And we're all forming memories all the time, which is great. Which is, you know, and our brain keeps doing that all, all of our lives and, and we're kind of motivated to go and seek that out. However... Um, there is some constraint to this. Oh, God. So, um, so we, we do have this scope for plasticity, um, but very much the way that we read the world is limited. So there's huge amounts of data that's coming from the outside world, and your brain basically filters a huge amount of that information based on your past experiences and makes a perception of the world, a sense of reality based on, on what what mm. your past experiences have taught you. So that could be your early years in life, for example, or your culture, um, all of those environments that basically go to shape your cartography, which then go on to affect how you see the world, and then which will then dictate how you interact with it. So there's another, this is, which is a really difficult concept to understand. So I, I kind of, I've got a little video again. I like these little videos. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's have a look at the next so, video. I'm still not convinced. So I hope this next one does it. Okay, this, well, hopefully this will convince you. Okay. Well, this is terrifying. So this, what is that? <laughs> this is, I think this is Albert Einstein, like, spinning around. So wait for a little bit, <laughs> and then it'll spin around. We're going to get to the back of Albert Einstein now, so the back of his little hollow mask. And the shadows are telling you that it's the back end of a hollow mask. But wow. your brain is seeing it as another face coming out. So you're ignoring those shadow cues and you're just seeing another nose and eyes kind of poking forwards rather than seeing the back end of the mask. So you'll do it again in a little bit. And that's because from your environment, you've just seen so many faces in your life. Um, so this is a common kind of uh, tweak in our reality that we make. So... Can we change our personalities? This is where I'm getting to now. This is like a little bit of a tangential kind of path. OK, so can you change your personalities? Yes, in some ways. There is scope for change because we have this plasticity. However, big, big, big caveat here. Uh -oh. um, in order to make changes, 
you've got to go against all of those inbuilt biases, those, those um, kind of filters in perception that you build up through your life that affect the way that you see your reality. And if you're... The, the way that the things that you want to change in your life are kind of really built into lots of different parts of your identity, lots of different parts of the way that you lead your everyday life, then in order to change certain aspects of your personality, you're going to have to break down huge amounts of connections within your mind and rebuild new connections. So that's going to be a huge amount of demolition and construction work. And it's going to be so much for your brain to do that... To be honest, most people's brains are too lazy, so the majority of people can't change their personalities. <laughs> that's my answer to that. <laughs> okay, all right, fine. All right, that's, that's, that's two for two. All right, you've convinced me, and you've definitely convinced the audience. Those fire emojis have really been pouring in. So let's okay. burn this myth. Okay, now you've been talking a lot about genetics and our programming and things like that, and, and this next statement seems to be uh, it, it basically reinforces everything that you've said, which is that it's only genes that count. So everything that you've said is that it's, it's, it's our genetics and it's our programming that, that counts. So if you're going to burn this myth, you're basically contradicting yourself, right? <laughs> I'm going to burn myself here. Let's do it. <laughs> it's Australia for okay, a reason. So so we've talked about genes, right? We've talked about hereditary right. basis and kind of um, instructing how that neural circuitry is laid down in the baby in the womb. We've talked about plasticity and the environment and culture shaping that cartography of the mind to give rise to each of us having this very individual connectome. Is there any other way that we can kind of change um, the ways that our brains function and the way that we behave? Um, there is. There's this new field of research called epigenetics, which is looking at how different environmental factors can actually affect the way that our genes are expressed to either dial up the volume of the gene expression or to dim it down so it's really low expression. Um, and that will then go on to affect and shape our neural circuitry. Now, this is a really new area of research, um, and it's still kind of the jury is still out there in terms of how it actually affects humans. Um, but it seems that there's a similar mechanism there. But I, I want to kind of draw your attention to one particular example study, which I love. Mm. Okay, so mice have quite similar brains to us. You may or may not believe it, but they do. They're quite evolutionary. And they can there's change their personalities to become human. That I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now mice love the sweet smell of cherries, right? So if you get a mouse and you um, waft in like a sweet smell of cherry, the, the chemical will hit their nose and it will send an electric signal from the olfactory bulb all the way up to a region of the brain called the um, nucleus accumbens, which mm. is kind of the motivation and reward and pleasure zone in the brain. So that will light up with activity. There'll be dopamine release and that will basically motivate the mice to scurry around in order to try and seek out this nice, nice cherry tweet. So they're Sorry. smelling something that makes them feel good and they're trying to get to the source is what you're saying. Exactly. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is an evolutionary ingrained kind of behavior. Now, what researchers wanted to do is they wanted to really mess with that evolutionary ingrained behavior. So what they did, this is pretty mean. They um, paired a mild electric shock to these poor mice with the sweet smell of cherries. So and very quickly, these mice started to learn that as soon as they smelt cherries, they would freeze up in anticipation of an electric shock coming. So they wouldn't be scurrying around looking for this nice little treat to nibble on. Instead, mm. that they would be kind of a bit petrified, just there waiting for the electric shock. Okay, so the researchers did that a few times. The mice learned very quickly using that beautiful plasticity mechanism of changing neural circuitry within the brain. But they should freeze up. So that's good. That's like a Pavlovian kind of conditioning. Type so that sounds so like parents putting hot sauce on their kids' thumbs to get them to, get them to stop sucking their thumbs. Or maybe I just oh, had... Oh, they do that? Do well, parents uh, do that? No. A friend of mine <laughs> told me something. <laughs> it's kind of like that, yeah, which I don't recommend. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so what the researchers did, is they left, after they'd done that to, to these mice, they left the mice um, to lead happy lives with no electric shocks and no cherries nearby at all. And the mice settled down and they had families. Um, and there was no chili, chili sauce there either. There was no cherries, no chili sauce, no electric shocks. 
for their pups or even for the grandchildren of the original pups, okay? So then wow. the researchers were interested. What's going to happen if they start wafting in the sweet smell of cherries now to these grandchildren of the pups? And interestingly, most of them were very, very hypersensitive and worried and concerned and freezing up in anticipation as soon as they started smelling this sweet smell of cherries. So the researchers were interested. How on earth had they passed on this traumatic memory across the two generations? Um, presumably the mice hadn't been chatting to each other about this, like, you know, electric shock cherry trick because they hadn't actually been together that much. So there wasn't that, op that opportunity for communication. So that's a fear that's been passed time. down genetically. So it still is only genes that count then. But, but how is it passed on genetically? Because how, like how, so this is what they were interested in, what mechanism passed it on? So what they did is they looked at the sperm of the grandfather and there's no change in the um, sequence, the genetic sequence, because an, um, an experience can't usually change the sequence of a DNA unless it's a mutagen, like a right. carcinogen that's going in and affecting it, right? So wh what is it about that experience that's actually changed the DNA? So it hasn't changed the sequence of the gene itself. What it had done is it changed the confirmation of the gene. So DNA is kind of usually it's in this beautiful helical structure, mm -hmm. and then it's wrapped up really tightly and tightly bound with lots of proteins so that you can, com like you can put those 3.2 billion base pairs into each one of our cells. So it's really tightly wrapped up in this amazing configuration that's quite complex. And what the experience had done is it had actually changed the configuration of this gene, and that, had, that configuration change had meant that, meant that enzymes couldn't access the genes in the same way. Wow. And so some genes were easily accessed and some weren't. And that changed the way that that neural circuitry was rooted. So instead of rooting it from the olfactory bulb to the nucleus accumbens, which is involved in pleasure, it rerouted the neural circuit to the amygdala, which is the brain region involved in fear. And so that, that wow. traumatic memory had been passed on across generations. Now, this is really early studies. That's a study that was in mice. Right. But it seems as though similar mechanisms might exist in humans, and it might explain why, for example, so there's been a few studies, small studies, looking at why um, U.S. veterans, when they return home from war, their um, descendants had an 11% higher mortality rate by their mid-40s. Wow. And also why okay. Holocaust descendants had um, a change in the gene expression, an epigenetic change in their cortisol chemical in the brain, which is involved in stress response. Incredible. And there's also a recent study that was looking at um, individuals that unfortunately had committed suicide, and you could see that there's an epigenetic change there in one of the genes that encodes a protein that's called BDNF, which is involved in yeah. resilience. Okay, well, you've convinced me, and again, I'm sitting here with egg on my face. Uh, I'm, I, I've obviously got a lot of reading to do. I will read The Science of Fate, actually. That's, that's not an empty promise. I'm actually going to do that. <laughs> and the audience is very much on your side. The emojis have been pouring in. So let's burn this myth. <laughs> all right. All right, Critchlow, you win this round. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Critchlow. I really appreciate your okay. time. It's, it's been a great time talking to you. Uh, audience, thank you so much for participating with, with, uh, with the emojis. And uh, stay legendary. Thank you so much. See you later. <laughs>